Hello and welcome to Popcorn Mumbles, where we dig into the back catalog to select a film or television show to rewatch. I'm your host, Cody Nestor. Alongside me is my co-host, Todd Heal. What's up, y'all? This week, we have chosen the 1967 film, You Only Live Twice. During the Cold War, American and Russian spacecrafts go missing, leaving each superpower believing the other is to blame. As the world teeters on the brink of nuclear war, British intelligence learns that one of the crafts has landed in the Sea of Japan. After faking his own death, secret agent James Bond is sent to investigate. In Japan, he's aided by Tiger Tanaka and the beautiful Aki, who help him uncover a sinister global conspiracy. You Only Live Twice was released in the U.S. on June 13th, 1967. On a budget of $9 million, it made $111 million. It has a Rotten Tomatoes score of 74% and an audience score of 68%. So, Todd, let's discuss You Only Live Twice. Spoilers are ahead. All right. So, Todd, You Only Live Twice is the 12th book, the 11th novel of Ian Fleming's James Bond series, and the last completed by Fleming before his death. Okay. Just want to put that in there. So, Todd, uh, before we get into the assignment, were where were you at originally with You Only Live Twice, and then where are you at again now after watching it and kind of going back and revisiting it? Originally, uh, if I'm just ranking just the Conneries, this was always my next to last, and it's still my next to last. <laughs> right. Only, I would assume the last is Diamonds Are Forever. Yes, sir, you are correct. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah, there's just, we've we've talked about it over the last couple of weeks. The Conneries, they're they're definitely slowly diminishing returns as you go. Right. Each one, well, I mean, you get the first three, they're all on the same level, and I think we talked about Goldfinger kind of peaks. Peaks. Thunderball dips a little bit, but not a lot. Right. Here you're dipping not... You don't go completely off the cliff, but you get near the edge. <laughs> right. That's how I would put it here. Yeah. And then when you come back from Diamonds Are Forever in a few years, it really goes off the rails. Yeah. And then we get to uh, the Moore era, and then to me, you know I'm not a Moore guy. Right, I've right. said that many times, and it, and it goes down. There's there's some good stuff in the Moors, but it goes down even more to me. Yeah. And there's there's a kind of a peak, which we'll talk about when we get to On Her Majesty's Secret Service, I yes. think. Yes. Um, but, Todd, what is what is James Bond's assignment this time around? So, uh, basically, uh, we have another first here in this series. This is the first time we've had scenes that are portraying outer space. Yes, this is very, this is the getting to the late 60s, the, obviously the space race, the Cold War, a lot of themes like that going on, a lot of uh, space age kind of stuff. But right. The opening of this film uh, and the space stuff that we see, 2001 A Space Odyssey, this is not. Right, right. The, the effects here are very hit and miss. That the, the first part of it, when you first see that Jupiter, uh, was it Jupiter 6, Jupiter 16, something, something like along that. Those lines, you yeah. see that, that shuttle, and I'm like, Ooh, this is this is already starting off a little rocky for me. So as you say, someone has got some kind of rogue rocket and they're using it to, uh, they've hijacked the U.S. capsule. Uh, we see like a little scene of like a kind of like a summit meeting and U.S. is blaming the Russians. The Russians are saying, hey, we didn't do it. And the U.K.'s like, guys, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Let's let us be the voice of reason here. Yeah, let here. us be the voice of reason here. You know, we kind of got an idea that the last time we got, were able to track this thing before we lost it, it went down somewhere near over China. Not China, I'm sorry, Japan. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're going to, you know, we got a guy in Hong Kong, you know, we got him on the case. Exactly. So we cut to James Bond, and as usual, he he's on the case, but he's in the bed. <laughs> yeah. He's in China, literally. Right. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, we see Bond's. Uh, this is our uh, this is our scene where uh, ba we basically have Bond faking his own death. Yes, I guess at this point Bond has become too well known in the organized you know the world of organized crime. He's got a lot of enemies to Spectre, so they set up a, a fake death scene. I guess it's uh, my my question about the fake death scene. Obviously, he's with uh, this girl named Ling, mm -hmm. and, and there's a there's a, a great interaction. Me and you quote it all the time. <laughs> yeah. what, what is it, Todd? <laughs> Okay, so uh, he's they're kind of you know having a little makeout session. He kind of comments something about you know why the Chinese girls taste different, mm -hmm. and she's like you know how, or and he's like I forget the other term he uses, but he compares them Peking duck and another type of food, mm -hmm. and she kind of steps back around the corner and she's like I give you very best duck. Yes, it's <laughs> and uh, <if> you... <laughs> no, just different. Like Peking duck is different from Russian caviar. I love them both. Darling, I give you very best duck. Well, that'd be lovely. Me and Cody, I don't know where we are. 
somehow, some way, we work that line into wherever we're at. I give you the very best duck. Todd. I give you the very best duck. And it's just, <laughs> it starts off right with, with it, it. There's the innuendo really gets ramped up in this field. It does. It really does. Uh, but we see uh, a couple, I think it's one or two goons come in. Gun type uh, goons. Yeah. yeah. She, uh, she rolls Bond up in a retractable bed into the wall. A couple goons come in, start firing, and just light up the bed with Bond inside of it. And then before our opening titles hit, we see Jimmy Bond lying in a pool of blood. Dun, dun, dun. Exactly. And then then roll opening title sequence. Uh, my question about that, uh, we also get some, like, kind of, guess, Hong Kong police coming in. Mm -hmm. Were the Hong Kong police in on this? Who exactly was in on this? Did Bond have, like, blood capsules in the bed with him, just ready for this to bust? Yeah, because he, he didn't have any shirt on. No. So he didn't have like a squib pack or maybe anything. Maybe they were like taped somewhere on the wall, or maybe right. it was somewhere yeah. he could get to it when he's, you know, kind of walled up. But like, who was in on this? You got a little packy that opens. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like, let me just squirt some ketchup on my side here. Right. But I'm like, my question is, was the Hong Kong police in on it? Because they had they had to have been because would they not just check this man's pulse and see that he's in fact alive? That's true. They had to have been in on it. Yeah, yeah exactly. So like that that's I, I don't understand exactly who's in on it. And I mean the, the story doesn't care to to tell us. Yeah, it, it doesn't you know. it doesn't really matter. Uh, but we get uh, we get Bond's uh, burial at sea. Right. Uh, this is our if I'm not mistaken, this is our first look that we ever get of Commander Bond. Yes. So this is one of the first times, you know, he actually holds like an actual British, you know, rank, and uh, he's Commander Bond of the British Navy. Yeah, I think right, so. Right. And then, like, we see his like obituary. We see a picture of him, and we see his burial at sea. They just dump him into the ocean in what <laughs> looks like a poorly rolled Marlboro cigarette. <laughs> right to the end, <laughs> into right into the ocean, right into the drink. And um, that's why, I, I, again, I continue to like question who was in on this because, like, um. Why does he need to be in the bag? If they think he's dead, why not just like replace his body exactly, with like a cadaver yeah. or like a bag full of fucking rocks? He could have been a limo somewhere on the way to, you know, a fancy restaurant. Exactly. Or he could have <laughs> like, he could have just like uh, got in a, a actual boat and been delivered to the submarine out at sea. Right. Why does he need, if he's dead, why does he need to actually be in that bag? Like, why would you just replace his they body? Had the budget to do it exactly. <laughs> like, I don't it just like, <laughs> I don't, I don't understand why he actually had to be dumped in the ocean and who was in on his death and who wasn't in on his death. It doesn't make sense. It's not clear. Right. The script doesn't care to elaborate <laughs> on it. They just think it's cool. Hey, we're going to dump Bond in the ocean. We're going to make you think he's dead. Surprise! We're going to cut his little mummy sarcophagus open and he's alive and well as Commander Bond and, and welcome aboard yeah. the HMS Convenience. <laughs> Uh, plot contrivance is what we'll call it. Right. Uh, but anyway, Todd, continue. So uh, we see that on the sub where we have a uh, Money Penny and uh, M, kind of in the same setup as in their office. Yeah, on in, the in sub in England. Yeah, is, you know, Money Penny's right outside. You know, M's little office on the sub. Yeah, and it's like <laughs> I don't know—is it me or uh, on this one? I mean, obviously Lois Maxwell, attractive woman in her own right, but uh, in her little kind of navy outfit, I was like, kind of to quote Cousin Eddie, I was like, she's looking really nice. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Lois Maxwell. You know, she ain't no slouch. Right. Exactly. <laughs> So uh, Bond kind of goes in. Uh, he kind of gets his little briefing from him. Uh, he basically tells him, you know, all hell's getting ready to break loose. Uh, basically, we're looking at a World War Three type scenario. If these things with these rockets isn't figured out, uh, the Americans are planning on launching another one. And he says, I think the Russians are planning on trying to get one out there before they do. So, in that briefing scene, is it just me? Do you feel this way? But like, I feel like every Connery film, the hairpiece gets worse. It's always attracting my eye to her. right. Like in that briefing scene, I'm like, this hairpiece still looks bad to me. Like, right. the, like he got it in Goldfinger and yeah. had it in Thunderball, and it, I commented that it looked kind of flat and weird. Kind of flat and, and Thunderball. And yeah. this one, it just looks off to me. Do you feel like that, or am I crazy? Do I just pay too much attention to it? I don't really notice it that much because okay. I, I mean, I don't, I don't. I guess I don't focus on it. I don't know. <laughs> right. Uh, so Bond ends up uh, traveling to Japan. Uh, right. He he gets he gets on his way to Japan. He's supposed to hook up with a guy over there named Henderson. Henderson uh, supposed to drop a kind of code word on him. I love you. Yes, he's uh, <laughs> exactly. Uh, Money Penny specifically in a little scene tells him that they picked a password he he won't forget. Uh, and this is another thing. So maybe I'm getting a little too nitpicky here, but this is the first Connery Bond film where I really feel like his age is starting to affect how I view the character and how I feel about the character. Right. 
And I'm like watching this and I'm like, you shouldn't be out in the field, old man. It's time to ride a desk. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, you look like you're 50. And then I was looking it up. He was 36. Wow. He was 36 when the filming started in July. And he turned thir- uh, he turned thirty seven the next month after filming begins, but he looks fifty, Todd. Yeah, he, he really looks old. In you this know, I've one. always kind of thought this about uh, not necessarily this one, but maybe but definitely when we get to diamonds. When by the time we get to diamonds, I'm thinking, yeesh. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, like, and I'm like it blew my mind that he was only thirty seven here because I'm like, I really thought him like he was probably in his late forties to early fifties by this point. Yeah. Totally wrong. He was thirty six, thirty seven. Um, just for context, Pierce Brosnan was only f- was forty two in Golden Eye. Wow! And Craig was thirty eight. But Connery in this series aged like a U.S. president. <laughs> like it really, <laughs> he had a lot. He on had him. that Obama aging, like right. where it's like he looked like a, a young strapping man, and by the end of it, he just looked, like I said, he looked aged like a like a U.S. president. Yeah. Um. But uh, <laughs> is it is it common practice, Todd, to shoot sailors or double O's out of torpedo bays? <laughs> To get to get rid of them out of the <laughs> you would think a commander in the British Royal Navy wouldn't just get shot out of a torpedo do tube. We, but <laughs> do we take the submarine uh, topside and just let him get into a boat, or how do we get Bond out of here? Oh, we shoot him out of a torpedo bay. <laughs> they had the money to shoot something out there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, I think know. that was a lot of the problem here. Uh, so, so what's going on in uh, Japan? So uh, Bond gets over to Japan. Uh, he kind of works his way over to. Uh, Meet someone at like a sumo wrestling match. He kind of gets his ticket. He sits down. I think Aki kind of comes in and sits down beside him. They kind of have a little interchange, and she tells him she can take him to Henderson. Uh, he, you know, she does take him over to Henderson's little Japanese house. Yeah, but we get to before that we get to watch the thing I always want to see in a in a Bond film, which is sweaty Asian men, su- sumo wrestlers, <laughs> sweaty Asian asses and gooch all right. over the place. Time. <laughs> right, right. That's what I want to see in a Bond film. Well, you know, they're in when in Japan. Yeah. <laughs> uh, she takes him to Henderson though, and uh, he opens the door, and I'm immediately like, "It's Blofeld." I know. Punch right? him in the fucking face, <laughs> like you know, because that that guy, that actor, would go on to play Blofeld in Diamonds Are Forever, right? Right. right. I, I don't know the actor's name. I, I should have. It here. Charles Gray, I'm pretty sure. Charles Gray. Charles He's also Gray. Our, our narrator for people the, uh, that have seen the Rock Horror Picture Show. He's another one of those, like, kind of like that era, those guys. Like, right. hey, there's that guy. That guy. Exactly. He's in this again. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, Henderson is kind of his contact. He gives him the password. Uh, he also has some kind of a prosthetic leg that uh, Bond makes sure is, uh, is, is there. Yeah. He makes the comment, I'm glad you got it right. Like, you know, <laughs> I'm glad you didn't beat the shit out of the wrong leg. <laughs> Thanks for that. <laughs> Uh, Henderson offers him a uh, uh, martini, stirred, not shaken, right, Todd? Gets it totally wrong. Totally wrong. But Bond takes it out of uh, complete courtesy. Uh, I like how Henderson's, uh, how he's just kind of in the middle of his his monologue and just, he's just like, just stops he cold. He just kind of locks up. Because he gets uh, assassinated. He gets knifed through the back of those uh, very thin, you know, kind of Japanese uh, walls. Yeah. And uh, so Bond goes out and kills the assassin instead of like questioning him at all. And then he, he steals his clothes and he's got like a mask on. And uh, I know he slumps over as he gets out and goes towards the car because he's like, oh, pretending to be hurt as he right. gets in the back of the vehicle. But I'm like, if you're that driver, wouldn't you been like, hey, did you grow a foot since you got you went up that hill to kill that guy? You're bigger than the other guy that crawled out of this the first time. Exactly. <laughs> like, why do you look a foot taller than the man that I dropped off five minutes ago? Right. Um. <laughs> so, um, there. Uh, another big plot point here is the uh, Asado Corporation. Right. So, take us through a little bit of that, Todd. So, the driver takes James uh, in the car and they drive back to Osado Corporation. He kind of works his way inside and he gets in a battle with, looks like one of those sumo wrestlers from earlier. Yeah, how do you fight a sumo wrestler, Todd? Uh, best you can. With a I couch. <laughs> it's with a couch, actually. Get and a lot of couch. A lot of office furniture. Right. That dude gets smacked with that statue so fucking hard. That dude <laughs> is dead. You cannot tell me that dude was dead. I don't think you see him again. Right. Uh, I looked up uh, in some of the, the kind of uh, behind the scenes stuff for this. Uh, that guy is actually, I have the note later on, I think, but I, I think he's the grandfather, great grandfather of uh, Dwayne Rock Johnson. Oh, really? Yeah, cool. that guy is. Um, but yeah, he gets he gets cracked so fucking hard, and uh, 
And this, he has that fight with him, and this this film kind of starts a trend that we'll kind of see pop up over the next few years in other Bond films where Bond does something, you know, usually some kind of calisthenics or activity or a fight or an action scene and immediately runs for booze right after, <laughs> you know right. you know what I mean? It starts that that kind of trend yeah. uh, through some other, that you'll see, you'll see it and like pop up over the years in, in uh, Bond films. But uh, So he gets the better of him over there, and you're like that little... Uh, uh, open up a little bar right there. Mm -hmm. He kind of leaves his body stashed in there. Yeah, and uh, he, he ends up finding uh, a safe. Right. Uh, and just so happens to have uh, some type of safe cracking device in his possession already in his pocket. You know, I mean, what double of, of worth anything wouldn't yeah, have one worth, of on his purse. Yeah, exactly. Worth their salt wouldn't <laughs> have a uh, safe cracking device in their pocket at all times, apparently, out of pure uh, convenience. What gets me is he, he successfully cracks it, but as soon as he opens it, the alarms go I was, off. I was just about to mention, I was like, you could have <laughs> just like cut the damn thing open with a blowtorch and right. or, or blew it open with some kind of small explosive that yeah. didn't ruin the internal contents but i'm like yeah what was the point of cracking this if it automatically sets off the alarm the alarm anyway right exactly uh so what does uh what does jimmy find in, inside the safe he gets some papers and i think there's a picture uh winds up being a picture i think of a uh, a boat and maybe like a coastline looks like a little village mm -hmm. he winds up taking that to uh after he kind of gets rescued by aki she kind of yes. picks him up in that little white convertible she's got yeah i think it's a toyota 2000 gt something like that right. nice little car uh, she actually takes him finally to meet uh, uh, Tiger, Tiger Tanaka. Mm -hmm. He's kind of the head of the Japanese Secret Service. As Bond falls through his uh, floor trap. His, his uh, false floor trap. Yeah, which is not the only false floor trap in this film, by the way. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, he falls in. Uh, Tanaka uh, tells him he loves him because that's, yeah. uh, that's gotta, the code. Gotta give him the code, yeah. yeah. I love you. I'm glad we got that out of the way. <laughs> Uh, he Bond kind of gives Tanaka the the documents uh, from Asado Corporation safe, uh, and he tells him it appears to be like an order for like naval stores, and then like part of the order is like uh, fifty containers of uh, what is it uh, locks, and Tanaka's like what is locks, and Bond is like well it's like the American word for like smoked salmon, and I'm like. Uh, but it, uh, but it's also like the 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 technical name for like liquid oxygen. I think is it yeah, think liquid oxygen. Right, yeah. And I was like, which is used in rocket fuel. And I was thinking to myself, like, what if it was like just a big waste of time, and it was really just about smoked salmon? Turned out to be a smoked salmon. Yeah, it like, was really just a smoked salmon smuggling. <laughs> yeah, or like it was just that that had nothing to do with any of this. It was just some order somebody placed for a bunch of smoked salmon, <laughs> and it was just like a red herring all along. Yeah. Um, also, he gets served some sake. I didn't know sake should be served at 98.4 degrees Fahrenheit, apparently. Man, Jimmy knows his stuff. <laughs> the The picture, I think, that you mentioned is of uh, a boat, right? The Ningpo. Right. Which uh, the pronunciation of that comes and goes. Sometimes it's a Ningpo. So, uh, later on, Tanaka calls it the Ningpo. I don't, <laughs> not sure which is correct. Um, but they, they, they look at that photo and they, uh, they zoom in on it and they zoom in on like some like uh, boaters beside of it. But I'm like, Tanaka's got better zoom capability in 1967 than my iPhone now. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> and it's like right up on it. Ningpo, like yeah. just as clear as the day. And I'm like, that's a very far away picture. Japanese tech so far ahead of ours. Exactly. Um, what, uh, what do we go uh, from here, Todd? I think Bond, he goes back the next day to Osaka Corporation. Osato, I'm sorry. Yeah. And he kind of passes himself off as like a businessman wanting to do business with Mr. Osato. I think he used the alias Mr. Fisher. Yes, Mr. Fisher, yeah, of So course. he's kind of sitting there in his office waiting, and he kind of flies in by helicopter. Uh, him and his, I guess, would be his uh, assistant, uh, Helga Brandt. Yeah, they, Asado and, and, and Brandt, they're both really, they're working for Spectre at the end of the day. I think she's, yeah. what, number 11. But, right. yeah, they're both Spectre agents at this point, but Bond doesn't really know that at this point. I thought it was kind of funny because she offers him, I think, champagne or a drink, and she's going over to, like, that, you know, the little where the booze is in the wall. Mm -hmm. And Jimmy's like, no, nah, I, I don't need anything to drink. I'm good. Because <laughs> he's worried that Sumo's still in there, that body's still in there. <laughs> right. That dead body's still in there. I don't, I don't need anything. You know what? I didn't even think about that. <laughs> yeah. I kind of like, I kind of, I, I was watching. Because when have you known Bond to refuse a drink? Yeah, exactly. I didn't yeah. even think about that. But you're right. Yeah, he yeah. was worried that body was going to be there. They act, that, there's a part in that fight where he he throws the the sumo guy through the wall, and that's been repaired with like like a rolling down kind of yeah. gate kind of thing. But yeah, I didn't even think about. It. He was worried about that sumo guy still being in there. Fortunately, the corpse is gone. Yeah, somebody <laughs> took care of that. And so uh, they, you know, Bond and Asado kind of have their talk and. Uh, you kind of see behind Osato's desk, he's got this nice, I don't know. It's x-ray desk. Yeah, x-ray desk. He kind of sees Jimmy's packing. <laughs> <laughs> well, really, Mr. Bond. Oh, oh. 
Oh. He's gun. He's gun. <laughs> we don't Nothing wanna, else. Nothing, we don't, we don't nothing know. lower. <laughs> I'm sure he's probably packing other things, too. But, yeah, he sees his gun, uh, and that kind of puts uh, that puts Osada onto, onto Jimmy pretty much uh, right away. So they kind of, you know, they kind of finalize their little deal or make their, you know, part their ways. And he's no more walked out the door, and he looks at hell, and he's like, kill him. This, this bugged the <laughs> fuck out of me because I'm like, they literally try to assassinate him in the parking lot. I know. He don't get two steps out of the building. I was thinking, you know, maybe they're going to try to hit him at a hotel that night. Follow or, him. Yeah, follow him, Taylor. Just follow him down the road. He, he's literally not even hardly out the door. and like, I was like, these are, <laughs> these are. <laughs> These dudes are working for Spectre, and I'm like, wouldn't wouldn't you want to like not bring that kind of scrutiny right to your doorstep? Exactly. If a man gets gunned down in cold blood by an automatic rifle in a drive-by on on the grounds of your company, somebody's gonna come along and ask some questions. <laughs> somebody's gonna I have think a little something to say. Yeah, I think the Japanese police might come around and be like, why did this guy seemingly be assassinated in cold blood right on your doorstep? Like. Narratively, it makes no sense. Exactly. Just have a scene where you follow him down the road to a, uh, to a Taco Bell and murder <laughs> him in the drive through And there's a lot of that in this movie. And we'll get to it about you should have killed him when you had the fucking chance kind of thing. So once again, Aki's waiting there for him in the convertible. Uh, they jump in. They drive off. Uh, they get tailed by those gunmen in the car. You know, Aki kind of calls uh, Tanaka. He's like, hey, can you get these guys off of us? <laughs> so, you know, what do they do? They send out a chopper. With a magnet on the bottom of it, big ass magnet lifts up the car, takes it out to sea, drops it in the ocean. Yeah, that, Tanaka's <laughs> like, "Do you like our usual reception?" And I'm like, "Your usual reception is get a cargo, a cargo helicopter to magnet lift a fucking car into the right. fucking ocean." Like uh, again, it's just like we had the money. If we had the if, budget, if we had the we had the money, we got to keep topping ourselves. Right. We got to keep we got to keep one up in what's come before. We're gonna lift the card. We're gonna drag it over the sea. We're gonna drop it. We I like when money. Aki is uh, is driving though, and she's kind of talking to Tanaka. And I like that the Japanese Secret Service uh, code uh, name for Bond is zero zero. Like oh, double O, and I was like, right, I thought that right. was kind of cool. Um, but uh, that's when we kind of go back uh, to. Um, I think it's uh, no bef before we get to that. Um, he does tell Tanaka in the car to contact Em right. and tell Em to send little Nellie and her father. And her father. <laughs> um, and then we go to the docks. And this really gets me because he goes to the docks and these these Japanese goons have no subtlety. He mm -hmm. goes to the docks and it's it's literally on site. They're on him like stink yeah. on shit. It's, it's like, like it's oh. on site. I'll run you over this goddamn forklift line. <laughs> I don't care. Like and then I'm like, how did they expect Bond at the why would they expect him at the docks? They Just, shouldn't have been, been looking for him. I mean, you wouldn't you, you in the story you wouldn't he wouldn't necessarily know he's going to the dock. Was there a company wide memo to like all Asado employees of like You see this man kill white man on site. <laughs> Anywhere on our property. Anywhere on any properties. But, yeah, I mean, it's literally those those Japanese slugs are, like, on site, Bond. You're getting run over. <laughs> You're getting forked with this forklift, my guy. Like, it's on site as soon as you step onto these docks. Um, and uh, he kind of takes them on this merry chase through the building and onto the touch of kind of the roof to kind of let Aki escape. He does a nice swan dive off the balcony know, into man. some boxes. Uh, thank God those boxes were there, Todd. Uh, but he gets captured. He does get knocked out it's by knocked a, out, yeah. yeah, by one of the thugs, and he gets into the uh, the custody on on a, I guess a Sato's boat or yacht or something, and he's in the custody now of uh, Miss Brandt. Miss Brandt and her kind of drawer of scalpels and um, uh, what does she call them? Uh, dermatomes. Yes. Her little drawer of torture. Now this this is again this this, this is the scene that bugs me the most, right, Todd? Okay. This you told me about one last night, but you didn't want to mention anything. Did you think it was this? I or, didn't think it was this. This huh? is the one. This is what I was messaging about last okay. night. I think my message was something like, "I'm watching you only live twice, and I'm I'm like dying right now, or something like yeah, that." So because like what, the first thing is like this is really getting into like this unbelievable territory because it happens multiple times in this film. But the first of it is like, she just has to kiss bond. She's just got to bed this dude for right. no reason. Right. Like there it's, 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 this this film devolves into girl meets Bond. Girl immediately wants to fuck Bond for no reason. <laughs> girl must bang Bond. Right. And that's what happens with Brant. She sees him. She's she works for Spectre. He's playing this angle to like, hey, I'm still I'm not really James Bond. 
you know, owner majesty secret service. I'm Mr. Fisher from this corporation, but I am a spy for a chemical company. I'll give you 300 pounds to split it with you. If you'll let me out of here, yeah. she releases him and you think she's going along with the plan. And then they bang, right? She's still a specter agent. They have him in custody. Her plan is not really to escape with him. She doesn't care anything about escape with him, but yeah. she, she cuts him free, lets him loose and to try to kill him. Instead of slitting his fucking throat <laughs> in that chair, what do they do? Torturing him for every inf- piece of information he has, mm-hmm. and slitting his throat on that on that boat. She takes him up in the plane because she's shown earlier to be a pilot. Right. She, she drops off a Sato in the helicopter. Yeah, and she takes him up in a plane, and she has uh, like a little lipstick bomb thing. She slaps drops a two by four yeah. on his hands. <laughs> She drops a lipstick bomb and she parachutes out of the plane so he dies in a fiery pain crash. Why? <laughs> you had him dead to rights on a boat and now you give him an easily escapable scenario. Exactly. It yeah. makes no sense. Right, like, why right. would you let him go if you weren't really going to, like, if you were going to say that she was flipping, I see it, and maybe, like, they, they kill her, yeah. uh, like, because yeah. she flipped. Yeah. And, like... You know, they're taking off and then they chase him in the plane or something. I could see something like that. But she, right. she's not flipping. Why well, let him off the boat? Why, Todd? Why well, let him walk out of the boat alive? Tell me this. Just slit his throat right there. Stick a scalpel in his carotid artery after you've tortured him for like a day and then be done with because it. Because it's James Bond. You, you can't <laughs> kill him now. I guess not. But it really, it really, really, it, it really got, it bugged me. Just torture him, like I said. Let him, let him give up whatever he's got and then dump his body into the sea for real this right, time. Right, right. <laughs> um, but instead, like I said, she takes him on a plane and it's just like, just, just like the whole thing is like, well, fucking what? <laughs> Uh, but he again, he gets out of. He does not die in the plane crash. Of course, he makes it. He makes it. Uh, he goes back to see if uh, what has arrived yet, Todd. Little Nelly. Little Nelly. So take us through the, the little Nelly scene. It arrives in four briefcases, by the way. Yeah, and uh, it comes with Q, yeah. and uh, there's a f- two or three guys that comes with Q to assemble it. <laughs> Some assembly yeah, required. It's a yes. pretty good size. Yeah, it's a yeah. nice little small, small one man assault copter. Right. And uh, basically, Bond's going to take it out to kind of, they've kind of narrowed down to where that boat was heading. And they're kind of going to go out and kind of scout out that area with little Nelly, kind of see what's out there, if there's anything up. And, uh, you know, he kind of takes little Nelly out. He's kind of looking around. The only thing he says he sees is, like, I think, extinct volcanoes. Yeah, and little Nelly is like, it's a gyrocopter. Yeah. It's packed to the gills with weapons. It's got missiles. It's got machine guns up to 100 yards. Little bombs that drop out on little parachutes. Aerial mines, <laughs> yes. It's got um, some type of, like, smoke device on yeah. it. It's just loaded to the gills. And, of course, when Bond's out there over the volcano, you have to have a uh, some type of action scene. Enemy so, spots. And I think yeah. three enemy copters get after Exactly. Him. And then even that bugged me. And I'm like, you're uh, for people who haven't seen this film, obviously there's a secret volcano layer where this is all going down at. Right. And why, if, if Bond was flying over, there's nothing to see. There's absolutely nothing. Why call to, attention to it? Why at all? call attention to exactly. it? Now you know, mm-hmm. you know that those copters were protecting something, and they probably launched from somewhere nearby. You right. only have a certain range that you could dial down. Yeah. Why would you even bother? Why would you just let him fly by and fly on? Yeah, you can't. There's nothing that he's going to be able to detect that secret underground volcano layer. So you're drawing attention to the fact of it after after all all things considered for no reason. Exactly. Uh, let me let me pause right here before I'll let you get back to the rest of that scene. Like, just kind of go through some of the gadgets and stuff like so far that we've covered. Uh, we talked about you know the the, the bed, the the uh, barrel at sea. Uh, there's a microphone purse. There was the safe cracking gadget, uh, the trap door slide. Uh, we have the the typewriter, uh, spying typewriter desk, the X ray desk, the yes. X ray screen. Uh, there's a lot of in video car conference in here. I noticed the word Sony. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, we have the explosive lipstick and the trick plane, uh, the little Nelly gyrocopter. Uh, there's also, a, later on, there's a trick bridge trap door in Blofeld's little office. Yes. And then uh, we'll talk about it later on, but the uh, the baby rocket in a cigarette. Yes. Which we're, uh, which we're yet to kind of get to. But uh, take us through the rest of the little Nelly here. So Bond kind of has his mid-air battle with the three other copters uh, using, you know, all the tech that little Nelly's got. Uh, get, a, get a, you know, a little... Uh, introduction to the James Bond theme and the action scene right there. Mm-hmm. Thought that was, you know, that's pretty cool. Right. <laughs> and Connery, As you go forward, it kind of gets overused in action scenes, I mm-hmm. think. But, you know, it's still, anytime you hear it kind of right now, it's, it's still welcome, I think. Yeah. And then just the, the little Nelly scene, I was kind of like, 
I mean, obviously Connery is still the best part of this film, right? Um, and the series to this point, but he just looks as bored as I was watching this. Like he just, and there's a lot of behind the scenes stuff. Obviously, this I was, was his last. Say, yeah. This was his last go around his bond, or intended to be his last go around his bond. There was yeah. a lot of friction between him and the producers, and you know things going on behind the scenes, and he was getting frustrated from I think the popularity of the character and always yeah. being labeled as James Bond and not Sean Connery, and so like he he was like you know he. He act, he stated as much that he was bored with the character and kind of kind of over the whole thing. But he really does in a lot of this. He just kind of seems like he's really kind of going through the motions, right? Which I get it, but I mean it's also to the detriment of the the, 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 the film the as film. well. Yeah, exactly. Um, the he we get more space scenes uh, at this point. The Russians are actually launching their next yes. their next rocket. The uh, the Blofeld's capsule returning back to the volcano layer. Boy, that's rough looking. <laughs> Again, 2001, this is not. Uh, yeah. the, some of the space stuff here. It's it's one of those films that it simultaneously looks very expensive and then in parts looks very cheap. Right. And I think some of the things like, you know, the miniature works and all that kind of stuff for the, the, the space stuff was kind of a little bit... Uh, giving a little bit less priority to stuff like building that huge ass volcano layer. Yeah. Apparently like it was like super huge and it could be seen from like three miles away and all this kind of stuff. So like it's, but there's parts of it again, simultaneously looks very expensive and then very cheap. Like right. the space stuff to me does not look good comparatively into the era of some of the sci-fi that you were seeing. Obviously it's not a sci-fi film, but just some of the stuff you were seeing at the time. Right. Really, uh, really wasn't happening. Um, <laughs> we we finally start to see Blofeld. We don't full on see him till later on in the film, but we see Blofeld's arm a lot. Again, we've mm-hmm. got the stroking the stroking cat. of the cat. Yeah, uh, there's there. You see his arm the first time I think when that uh, the claw machine that's uh, removing the capsule right. from out of there. Uh, we see his like his left arm. And he's like petting that cat, and it was like bugging me because like I was looking at the close ups of the of his arm and the cat, and he has like some kind of crap all over his arm. I don't know if it's like fuzz uh-huh. or like cat food, right. but like there's like stuff all over his like <laughs> forearm, and I'm like, what is that in that close up? I'm like, can we get a lint roller in the here? The wonders of 4K resolution. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I did watch it in 4K on iTunes. Exactly. Um, what happens with Brant uh, and Osato in uh, Blowfield's little lair there? So he kind of he's kind of reprimanded him for uh, letting Bond go. Why haven't they killed him yet? And uh, you know, one of them you kind of get the feeling one of them's getting ready to bite the bullet. And uh, Osato kind of makes it across the bridge, but unfortunately, Miss Brant does not. Yes, he <laughs> drops her into a uh, a, a pool of uh, piranha. His, yeah, man eating piranha, pretty much. Uh, going back to Bond at this point, um, Tanaka's kind of taking him to his ninja school. Yes. Um, and this is where in the film uh, a lot of uh, kind of like a Goldfinger, and I mean a lot, all all the films to to a certain extent, but you get some amazing scenery here. Mm-hmm. That the the shots going around, in and around that ninja training school and all that stuff, very beautiful, beautiful scenery. Yeah, yes. very very beautiful scenery. That's where we get the uh, the scene of all the ninjas training. Mm-hmm. That's when we get uh, some of the uh, the Japanese side showing off uh, to uh, the way, yeah, yeah to uh, to uh, James Bond. Uh, we get the 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 rocket firing baby cigarette. <laughs> <laughs> which is uh, demonstrated by uh, Tanaka. Yeah. Uh, this is where um, another thing I don't understand about this movie, and we'll, we'll get into it as we go here. Um, at this point, they want Bond to kind of go undercover. Tanaka's like, you need to go undercover. Right. And we have a, a I'm a girl. We're going to make you Japanese. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're going to, and we're going to have you marry her. And... Bond's like, well, is she attractive? Is she hot? Is she bangable? And he's like, she's got a face like a pig. <laughs> and you're like, what is happening right, right. now? Right. What are what, they doing? What is happening right now? And then you see her later, and she's a very fair-skinned girl, and she's got, like, the most delicate features you've ever seen on a human being ever. It totally does not have a face like a pig. Right. And I'm like, why say that? Was why? he just messing was with him, just I guess? messing with him? Yeah, that's... But the making, the making Bond Japanese scene, it's baffling to me, Todd. Yeah, this is probably... I would say the first time in this series so far where I've been like, come on now. Yeah. They, they, not only are they going to turn him Japanese, but he says he's going to teach him the ways of the ninja. Yeah. And they got, well, like 
three days, two days? Yeah, like, well, maybe five days, maybe. And nowhere after that do you see Bond do any kind of nin- no kind of karate kick, no kind of ninja move, no. nothing. No, uh, and they literally to turn in Japanese, they literally shave his chest hair. <laughs> and there's a whole there's a whole thing about that before when uh, the Tanaka's uh, girls are bathing him, and he's like, you know, the, the kind of Japanese proverb, you know, bird never make nest in bare tree, uh, right. talking about his chest hair. But yeah. they shave his chest hair. They put literal prosthetics on his eyes to his make eyes. his his eyes look more Asian, let's say. Uh, and then um, they they put a wig on him, a bad wig on a him. A bad wig on him. And then you see him step out for the first time, and boy, it's cringe. It is very cringeworthy. Completely and utterly cringe. And this leads to a scene, uh, He he's, Aki is kind of with him. Mm-hmm. Uh, this leads to a scene, uh, I'll call, we'll call it the poison thread scene. Poison thread, So yeah. an assassin sneaks in, to the night into to Bon and Aki's room, uh, and they he's he's up in like the rafters, and he's he leads a little thread down. He he runs the poison mm-hmm. down the thread. Bon moves at the last second. It goes in onto Aki's mouth and onto her lips, and she she is killed. Bon notices the dude in the rafters, has a clear sight line to him, shoots him twice or something like that, and that yeah. dude, that dude's dead. He's gone. And I'm like, if you if Bon had that clear a view of you, what just shoot him. <laughs> Why, right. I mean, like, I, I guess it's like, well, I don't, we don't want to, I don't want to draw tension. We don't want to make it a big thing. I'll, yeah. we'll poison him. Like, dude, do, do blow gun him in the neck with the poison. Right. Do something. If you have that clear a shot, don't wreck, take a risk with the poison string. Exactly. Use like, a gun with a silencer and plug him. A silence weapon, a yeah. blow dart with po- a poison tip. Like, because like when Bond shoots that guy, he's like in clear view of where Bond can see him. Yeah. So if Bond can see him, that guy can see Bond. Exactly. And it's just like another thing that really like, it, it bugs the, the fuck out of me. Uh, the next day, uh, another assassin makes a attempt on his life. The uh, the uh, the bamboo pole assassin, we'll yeah, call him. That guy. He fights. Uh, he fights the guy with the bamboo pole with a knife sticking out of the end of it. Mm-hmm. He takes the uh, the pole away from him and sticks him with his own knife, and and kills that guy. So he has two assassination attempts made on his life after he's went undercover. Take note of that, folks. He's not blending in too well. Take take note <laughs> of that. Um, so um, <laughs> because that that brings me to this point. Um, from there. It's um, it's really pretty much we're moved into our third act. It's about we want to go find out. Um, we got we're still figuring about with the Ningpo. We're still figuring all that stuff out. Yep. Aki mentions that a girl you kind of see in the village when they're getting married. A girl's like funeral. Mentions she died in this cave somewhere nearby. Bond finds that um, kind of uh, unusual and interesting. Kind of questions her about that. So they. They make a plan to go sneak out with the rest of the fishermen in the village to kind of go into the boat and then sneak away and kind of check out that cave. But my point about the undercover stuff, why does Bond really need to marry that girl in like what's seemingly a real ceremony? Why why did he need to go through all that effort? Yeah. Um, why does there need to be a whole ceremony? Obviously, Spectre knows that Bond is there. They've tried to kill him twice now. The undercover stuff is not working, it's not Todd. Working. Obviously, the the six foot the six foot Scottish man in the bad wig is James Bond. <laughs> so they go right to him and try to kill him twice. Like he doesn't need a wife. I'm like, and if he does, just send a woman with him. Yeah. Why go through all this stuff? And like you said, how we're binding be- was that wedding? How binding is that? Exactly. <laughs> but it's like, and then it's like you said, um, um. <laughs> like, why do you need uh, Bond supposed to be trained in the ninja? You never seen any of that stuff. It's, never it's for, seen him do anything like a it's ninja. For, it's like for two days. They give him this fake wife. You put these prosthetics on him. All this undercover stuff for what? Spectre obviously knows exactly where he is. They've tried to kill him twice while he's undercover. Right. It's time to go loud, folks. Yeah. This playing it soft. It's time to put the tux and you know tie it back on ex- and get at it. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Or some kind of you know some kind of espionage suit, which we we, we get later. Uh, later, but we're we're, we're uh, you just you're just wasting time in this movie is, is a lot of what it is. Um, <laughs> so take us through uh, the cave and all that stuff, Todd. So him and his, I think it was his wife that goes out with him. And they go out with the fishermen, mm-hmm. and they kind of separate and go to that cave. And they didn't want to get into it, and he tells her to get over the side, you know, that he smells gas, and mm-hmm. that thing is full of gas. And so they kind of swim back out and make it back out. And I think he also makes a comment about a lot of sulfur buildup in there. Mm-hmm. And I'm assuming maybe that was from uh, lava flow from back when it was an active volcano. 
maybe something I'm not like sure. that. Uh, there's when they first go out on the boat, something I, I just like they go out on the boat and it's like sunset and mm-hmm. you can see Bond paddling out and the lighting. I mean, it's obviously rear projection and you can see the lighting on Bond and I can kind of buy that he might be in a boat at sunset. Yeah. Then they turn around to the lighting on her on uh, his on Kissy Suzuki, mm-hmm. who is his wife. She's never yeah. actually named in the film. Uh-huh. Uh, and the lighting on her is like she's in the br- she's not in the same scene. It's right. like the brightest light you've ever yeah. seen in your life. And I'm like, it looks terrible. And there's a part where, like you're talking about where they swim away from the gas. You can really see how uh, how uh, Thean Connery's hair is getting in his underwater scene. There's some definite streaks of ball patches in right. there. Uh, it's like <laughs> just 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 stuff I noticed when watching this because I was like kind of getting bored out of my mind at this point. So I know that there was something about that sulfur buildup in that cave that led them to look up at the top of the mountain, some kind of old runoff maybe or something from a lava flow, which kind of leads them to go up to the top. They see the helicopter too. Yeah, the helicopter. Yeah. yeah, so they make that lands in broad daylight again. Why would you be <laughs> landing those helicopters in broad daylight at right. the volcano? Land them like two miles away and ferry in by boat because they say there's tunnels. Like he, they yeah. say that there's tunnels all under there. Have one tunnel leading in that nobody knows about, and the park the helicopters fifty yards away, or not fifty yards, but fifty miles away, right. or twenty miles away, or whatever. Like, why are you landing helicopters in broad daylight? Again, it's just little stuff that nobody thought about that doesn't make any sense. Like, Blofeld wanted to get caught <laughs> at this point in my mind. You he wanted, didn't care anymore. you want to get caught. So they kind of make it to the top, and uh, Bond kind of notices the, you know, the volcano lake, and he asks his wife, you know, how deep are these things usually? And she's like, you know, deep. He throws a rock, you know, expecting to hear this spadoosh, mm-hmm. and it's just clanging on metal. So he realizes, hey, you know, this is just a, you know, a cover for, you know, an entrance to a base more than likely. The uh, the rocks around it, they're supposed to be real rocks, right? Yeah. In, narratively in the story. Yes. The other rocks around that that uh, crater roof. It's supposed to be real. Mm-hmm. Did you notice when he steps back up on it, it bounces? I did not Like it's a cheap that. set made in the 1960s. Wow. <laughs> it's, again, little stuff that I right. did pick, but you see it when Bond steps back on it. You see those rocks bounce. Yeah. And then, like, a later when the ninja team comes in, it's also bouncing. Uh, he sends uh, Kissy back to tell Tanaka, bring everybody. Yeah, bring basically. everybody. This is it. Uh, and Bond puts on his phantom costume. Yes. It makes him look like the character, the Phantom. <laughs> <laughs> it's supposed to be his ninja outfit, but it makes him look like the Phantom to me. I think he's able to make his way in as that copter comes back out. I believe yes. that was how he gets in. Yeah, climbs down like a pole. Now the volcano lair is great. They spend a lot of money. Mm-hmm. It has a nice design, great features. It's at this point, it's iconic. It's been parodied many times. It's, right. It's one of those things like you're a super villain. You have a secret volcano lair, some kind of secret lair somewhere. Yeah. This this is what the movie that started all that. Right. Um, but yeah, this is where Bond is eventually captured. He kind of goes through, there's obviously with Blofeld's capsule and, uh, his rocket stealing all these, he, these shuttlecrafts and everything. It also has stolen the astronauts that have uh, been aboard those vessels. Right. Bond rescues some of the astronauts. He then, um, takes on, uh, they take out the astronauts that are preparing to launch in Blofeld shuttle. And, uh, he's, he's trying to get it, make his way into the shuttle. Uh, Blofeld kind of notices him on the camera, like, Hey, something's off with this dude. Stop that man. Again, he's <laughs> seven feet tall yeah. and he's, he's carrying his air conditioner to enter the capsule, which Blofeld says you would never do. And this is where we get our first kind of actual of all these movies so far. This is what our fifth movie this is our fifth, yeah. Yeah, this yep. is our fifth movie. We've seen Blofeld in shadow, stroking his cat many times. Just a hand and a lap. Just a hand and <laughs> a lap. And now we finally have an actor and a face to to Blofeld, which is uh, Donald Pleasance. Oh, yeah. Uh, a fine actor. Mm-hmm. Uh, people know him from this, obviously from the Halloween franchise. Right. As Dr. Loomis. And, uh, I mean, overall, the look of Blofeld. Looks looks great. Looks great. You love this. I love the scar and everything. Mm-hmm. Like it fits that. He looks like a guy that would have a volcano layer. Though. Right. <laughs> he, he fits the part. <laughs> exactly. Uh, take us through our ending though, Todd. So uh, after he gets kind of caught by Blofeld there, and they, they kind of get wound up up there in the kind of control center. Uh, you know, they're kind of waiting for they. This time they got the rocket is the Soviet rocket. They've kind of made their rocket look like the, the capture rocket look like the Soviets. So when it goes up to capture that last American capsule, it's going to start World War Three, obviously. Mm-hmm. Uh, Bond, you know, being Bond, uh, doesn't have his gun, doesn't have his gadgets, but he, he, can, he can have a cigarette. <laughs> so he goes over and gets one of those rocket firing cigarettes, proceeds to like to explode that into the control panel. I think that kind of breaks free something loose up at the volcano lake. 
That's when Tanaka and his band start coming in. He hits the roof control. Roof control. He, he, he hits that crane control operator with the rocket, and then he hits the control long enough for like some of them to get in. Right. Tanaka's guys kind of some repel in, and then eventually one, one of their them, guys sets a bomb yeah. and blows the rest of it up. Exactly. Yeah, that's you, it. You get a big fight uh, between Tanaka's ninja guys and all of Blofeld's uh, uh, goons that are dressed in their uh, mayonnaise, mustard, and ketchup suits. Right. Everybody's right. either got a white or red or a yellow suit on. Uh, but, yeah, that's where we get our last fight. So, uh, Lofa and Bond kind of have one final encounter on, like, one of those little uh, little car things that kind of runs on a rail through the mm -hmm. middle of the complex. A lot of sheet metal. A lot of sheet metal, yeah. yeah. Uh, Blofeld escapes. Uh, he gets a ninja star to the He gets a ninja star, board. though, yeah. Uh, he makes his escape. Or well, you think he's escaped because he comes back in time to set off the uh, destruct for the entire island. Yeah. Going to blow up the entire volcano lair. Yeah. And then... Uh, uh, what is it? There's there's a part. I mean, I guess everybody. It's just pretty much them getting out at this point, isn't it? By then, it? it's just them getting out. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think I'm missing anything there. It's just about pretty much escape at this point. Blofeld gets away after setting off the detonation. Yeah, so he's obviously he escapes the movie. He's still alive. Right. Uh, the volcano layer blows to bits. Uh, disasters averted. Once again, Bond is on a raft in the middle of the that water. Was, I was going to say that next. <laughs> with the girl. Bond is floating at sea with, with the woman, but this time there's a submarine underneath they them. They just come right up underneath him, lifting him up out of the water. Yes, exactly. And, and that's that's our last kind of shot of the film. Uh, roll credits there. Uh, my, my, my lingering question about this is, Todd, I watched this whole two-hour movie. What, what was Blofeld's goal? Can you tell me that? Yeah, I mean, because... I mean, if he gets the America pissed off enough to Russia to start World War Three, is it just about? Where's he going? <laughs> I, that, like, if we blow up the world, where, where's that's where's the he only going? thing I can figure? Is it just about starting World War Three? Like, right. I don't. I feel like his his plan was very like ambiguous. Like, I don't feel like it was like it was just it was just like. <laughs> like I don't know, havoc for havoc's sake, you know. Yeah. Like it doesn't seem like there was anything. Yeah, like, this time there's no, you know, ransom for anything. No, you know, give us this amount of money, this won't happen. You right. Know, there's nothing really for him to gain other than hey, I started World War Three. Yeah, it just seems like just to do blow. Just to <laughs> but if we start dropping nukes, yeah, well, well, good is, that gonna is, do this, you? is this Blofeld's version of like some men just want to watch the world burn? Maybe is so. that what this is? Could be. Uh, <laughs> all right, we'll take it that. But I was just like sitting there after the movie was over and i'm like what, what was blowfield playing like I, was, I get the plan like in terms of what he was doing but what was but he why, to gain from it yeah. why was he doing it right uh todd i got a couple double o nose here okay again i put these in these are goofers uh goofers goofs are continued <laughs> these are goofers <laughs> these are goofers guys <laughs> these are goofs or continuity errors that uh if i notice them in the film and then i uh i look them up and uh, if someone else has noticed them i kind of put them in here uh just a few mostly continuity stuff uh, when Bond and Kissy leave the boat, it's obvious that Bond has nothing on under his shirt. Upon arrival at the volcano, he removes his shirt to reveal a ninja outfit, which uh -huh. we talked about. A ninja uh, blows a wide hole in the volcano's roof to allow his fellow ninjas to enter. In subsequent shots, the roof is in perfect condition. Oh, Little Nelly takes some bullet hole damage to its rudder during the helicopter battle scene. The bullet holes disappear in all subsequent scenes. John, I'm sorry. They got us. And when Bond kills the ninja who surprise attacks him, he clearly stabs him in the hip. In the next scene, the blood is on the ninja's torso and not his hip. Also, there's no blood on the weapon either. This Dang. is the, the bamboo assassin. Gotcha. Uh, you want to put some Bond bits up in you? Let's do it. All right. So while scouting locations in Japan, the chief production team narrowly escaped death. On March 5th, 1966, producers Albert R. Broccoli and Harry Saltzman, director Louis Gilbert, cinematographer Freddie Young, and production designer Sir Ken Adam were booked to leave Japan on a flight 9-11 uh, departing Tokyo for Hong Kong and London. Two hours before their uh, Boeing 707 flight departed, the team was invited to an unexpected ninja demonstration and so missed their plane. Their flight took off as scheduled, and 25 minutes after takeoff, the plane encountered severe turbulence and disintegrated over Mount Fuji, killing all aboard. Wow. Yeah, never knew that. Dang. Uh, the volcano set cost almost as, almost as much as Dr. No in 1962, uh, its entire budget. It was so large it could be seen from three miles away, as I mentioned before. Wow. The henchman Bond fights in Osato's office was played by Samoan pro wrestler The High Chief, Peter Fanine Maivia, grandfather of The Rock, Dwayne Rock never Johnson. Never knew that. 
The relationship between Sir Sean Connery and the producers detor- uh, deteriorated to the point where he refused to act if they were on set. As uh, was anticipated to be Sean Connery's last appearance as James Bond, publicity material released in advance of the movie announced Bond would be killed, married, and become Japanese. While these events were portrayed in the film, they were actually ruses as a part of Bond's undercover activities. Ah. The rocket pistol and cigarette rocket were real-life weapons that were featured uh, after the manufacturer paid for the product placement. It was hoped they would become standard military and intelligence equipment. However, they proved to be too expensive. Ammunition cost three times as much as normal ammo. They were also clumsy, so they were useless at a distance over 15 yards and unreliable. They were horribly inaccurate intended to start fires and cease production in 1969. Dang. <laughs> Out of simple courtesy on Bond's part, this is the only movie in which he accepts a martini that is stirred, not shaken. This is an intentional joke by the producers, not a mistake in the script. The last Bond movie to make extensive use of voice dubbing in this movie and most of those made previously, many of Bond's leading ladies and villains were dubbed over by other actors and actresses. This practice rarely occurred in future Bond movies. Little Nelly was based on the real-life Wallace Autogyro. Its inventor, Wing Commander K.H. Wallace, actually flew Little Nelly in this movie. The machine was incorporated into the plot after production designer Sir Ken Adam heard Wallace in a radio interview in discussing his invention. Wallace had to log 85 flights in total to film the sequence. It was filmed in the Japanese mountains except for one scene. The scene where the rockets were fired was filmed outside of Japan because Japanese law forbade the firing of rockets in the air. Oh, Smart policy, I'd say. I would say. Uh, Nancy Sinatra was asked to perform the title song after her father Frank passed on the opportunity opportunity and the last bond bid i have here for you todd this movie was released two months after casino royale in 1967 this was the first of two times that uh two james bond movies would be released in the same year it occurred again 16 years later with octopussy and never say never again in 1983 that is true what a year that what a year that was glad i wasn't around for that Uh, we rank films on a 1 to 10 scale. Starting from 1, the ranks are torture, 2 awful, 3 bad, 4 subpar, 5 mediocre, 6 decent, 7 good, 8 great, 9 amazing, 10 masterpiece. Todd, give us your final thoughts and review score for You Only Live Twice. I had a couple of things here just before I get to my review score. Uh, did you pay attention to who was credited as the screenplay for this movie? It was Roll Dahl. Oh, I, I didn't pay attention while watching it, but now that you mentioned when I was kind of researching some stuff, I did notice his name coming up. For those of you that may or may not be familiar, Roll Dahl wrote uh, the children's book, Willy Walker and the Chocolate Factory. Yep. And also, I just wanted to give a little spotlight or shout out here to uh, Ken Adam. Uh, Ken Adam worked on all the Connery films except for From Russia with Love. He also did two more films, The Spy Who Loved Me and Moonraker. The only reason I mention it here is because I believe this hidden volcano-based set is probably one of the most, I mean, as far as scope and scale for that era, probably the best thing he may have ever put to film. It's uh, it's great. Agreed. <laughs> Agreed. Uh, final thoughts. Uh, you know, You Only Live Twice, I think, is, you know, a, still another good entry in the Bond franchise. I think at this point we've kind of found our foundation and expectations that we've kind of already established. We kind of know what to expect, uh, what we're likely to see pop up, and what may get us into, through, and to the plot end. Uh, You know, there's a couple of hard sales in this one for me, uh, particularly uh, turning James Bond Japanese, uh, trying to teach him the ways of the ninja in about three to five days. (laughs) (laughs) Three to five business days. Three to five business days. You can Uh, be a ninja. You know, this one's got some issues, I'm not going to lie. That's why it ranks close to the bottom of my Connery films. Uh, I still give it a seven. I still think it's good. Okay. All right. So we're, we're, we're a little bit differing opinions on this one. I I feel that, it, again, as we talked about before, Diminishing Returns, we're starting to really f- fall off here for me. Again, this gets into more of that super spy uh, genre that we were talking about instead of spy espionage. We're in a, we're definitely in the super spice territory right. here. Uh, the turning bond Japanese, the 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 plot the contrivances, and and not really thinking out some of this stuff. I know it's maybe nitpicky or seen as that by many by me of some of the things that I have kind of pointed out here, but it's stuff that really kind of bugs me. And it's it seems like it was kind of rushed along. And there's a lot of scenes and right. things that happen just because we got to one up what's come before. We've got to outdo Thunder ball and goldfinger it's got to be bigger and better more action more this and that and it's it, it's focused around that instead of telling a good story gotcha. and, an, and an effective story so for me i give you only live twice a five out of ten which ranks it as mediocre 
Uh, Todd, tell everyone how they can find us and stay up to date with us on social media. We're at Tao Capes on YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram. Tao Capes Podcast on Facebook. You can also email us at TaoCapesPod at gmail.com. Uh, if you enjoy the show, please consider following us on your podcast platform of choice and subscribing to our YouTube channel. Popcorn Mumbles will return next week. We want to thank you so much for listening. Until next time, bye, guys. See you, guys.